Well, hopefully I'm live on Facebook. I'm not entirely sure because I'm <laughs> running this myself. Um, but it's uh, if you're out there, it's an absolute pleasure to see you. It's an absolute pleasure to be here to host this uh, Holy Communion service uh, for St. Paul's Church. Welcome to you, uh, whoever you are and wherever you're watching from and whenever you happen to be watching it, um, knowing that not everybody watches on a Sunday evening but catches up later. But it's great to welcome you here. My name's Jim Findlay. I'm the priest in charge of St. Paul's Throop um, and uh, I'll be leading you through this service this evening. Um, and uh, later on, Simon will be um, reading for us our set reading for tonight, which is from Philippians chapter one in our continuing series on discipleship defined. Um, and uh, it's good that tonight we have a, a visiting preacher, uh, not one of our usual crew, but um, a visiting preacher in the shape of David Hilborn, who's the principal of Moreland's College. Um, I don't, won't say any more because I might steal his thunder, um, but he'll be preaching a little bit later on. And um, also to say that as we remember all that the Lord has done for us uh, in his life, his death, his resurrection, his ascension, his ongoing ministry to us. As we remember everything uh, about him tonight, as we gather around the table, it might be helpful for you to have some bread and some wine with you and whoever's watching this with you uh, uh, so that you can share in that bread and wine as we come to that, that moment around the communion table uh, or around my desk. Um, uh, later in the service and the um, uh, desk is the accurate word I'll just uh, give you uh, a look there you go there's moving to the other camera we have some bread and some wine um, and hopefully you'll have some at home too and we can be sharing in that together so as we prepare to worship the Lord this evening um, I'd like us to uh, consider the opening words of Psalm 149 that direct us to worshipping the Lord. We, whatever is going on around us, whether it's tough, whether it's easy, we're always reminded that our eyes should be fixed on Jesus the Lord. Our eyes should always be looking heavenward. Uh, our worship should always go that way, whatever is happening around us. So let's take a moment and let's consider Psalm 149. The psalmist writes this, praise the Lord, sing to the Lord a new song, his praise in the assembly of his faithful people. Let Israel in rejoice in their maker, let the people of Zion be glad in their king. Let them praise his name with dancing and make music to him with tambourine and harp, for the Lord takes delight in his people. He crowns the humble with victory. And so, Heavenly Father, we ask that this evening we would know your presence with us, that when we come to worship you, we would, Lord, we would make music to you in our own way. May our voices rise and be heard by you. And Lord, may we know that you take delight in us, your people. And Lord, may that lift us for the days and weeks ahead. May it inspire us to serve you as your disciples in this, your world. Be at work in us this evening, Heavenly Father, and receive our praise. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Now, our first song this evening uh, just reminds us of the work of the Lord and reminds us to praise him for what he has done. And uh, it does it with, uh, with great words. Uh, the song is the greatest day in history. Uh, happy day, some people call this song. And um, it directs us, directs our hearts and minds in the right way. So let's worship him with this song. Cross the empty grave 
well maybe that was my first disaster of the evening um somebody was saying they can't hear the music so i'm going to attempt um to try something different to see if that makes any difference um
and we I'm gathering that I was on I was on mute then so you probably didn't hear a word I said did you hear the confession anybody well no you didn't oh it's going so well this evening um, please pray for patience as you pray for everything else um, okay at this point I'm going to assume maybe then that you read through the confession um, and at this point we're going to hear from Simon who will unmute um, and will um, read to us from Philippians. Simon, over to you. Thank you, Jim. So this, so this is, from is from Philippians, Philippians 1, 1, verse, verse 1, 1 to 11. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all God's holy people in Christ Jesus at Philippi, together with the overseers and deacons, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God every time I remember you in all my prayers for all of you, and I always pray with great joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. It is right for me to feel this way about all of you, since I have you in my heart, and whether I am in chains or defending and confirming the gospel, all of you share in God's grace with me. God can testify how I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. And this is my prayer, that your love may abound more, more and, and more, more in, in knowledge, knowledge and, and depth, depth of, of insight, insight, so that, so you, that may you may be able, able to discern, discern what is, what is best, best and may, and may be pure, pure and, and blameless, blameless for the, for the day, day of Christ. Christ. Filled, filled with the, with the fruit, fruit of righteousness, righteousness that comes, that comes through, through Jesus to the, to the glory, glory and, and praise, praise of, of God. God. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. Amen. So thank you, Simon, uh, for that. And um, we are going to um, hear now our sermon uh, from David Hilborn, principal of Moreland's College. And... Uh, by that time, I will have started to breathe slowly and everything will happen as it should rather than as it shouldn't. Um, so uh, just as we go into uh, listening to David, let's let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you for Simon being here uh, and for reading that passage for us. And we just pray that we would be blessed and Lord, our, our hearts and minds would be taught by what David speaks to us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good evening and thank you so much for this opportunity to share God's word with you again. It's wonderful to be sharing worship once more with you. I'm really, really thrilled, particularly that Jim has asked me to speak on this series, Discipleship Defined, and particularly into the passage that was read for us earlier from Philippians chapter 1, verses 1 to 11. The reason is that we're dealing with a subject here which is so close to my own calling. As you know, I'm principal of Morelands College. We educate and train people for Christian ministry in all its forms and we love doing that and I've been in this field for three decades. I began teaching uh, linguistics actually at Nottingham University, uh, Secular University some three decades ago but um, graduated into teaching theology and training people for uh, Christian service uh, after that and I've been doing that for something like 25 years and the reason why discipleship matters to me so much is it's because we are in that business of forming people for it at Moorlands and in the other places I've worked in Christian education, but also that the basic meaning of the word disciple in the New Testament is student. And I've been thrilled and privileged to train many students uh, in my time. The word in Greek, mathetes, which is used in the Gospels and the Book of Acts frequently to describe a follower of Jesus, somebody who is learning with Jesus, uh, is a word that absolutely underpins what it means to be a Christian. 
Uh, it's indispensable. It really needs to be at the core of Christian experience. It's a word that actually was quite commonly used in other contexts, not just uh, in the Christian sense uh, in the ancient world. Uh, for example, in John chapter 9, we see the Pharisees describing themselves as disciples of Moses, those who learned the law and are experts in the law and teach the law as well as it happens as rabbis, which was the word that was used to describe those who would pass on their learning so that others can be disciples of a particular subject. So it has that general meaning in the Jewish community that Jesus grew up in. Uh, it also is a word that's applied to his forerunner, John the Baptist's followers. They are described also as disciples. For example, in Mark 2 verse 18, where they're fasting. Um, and again, also in John chapter 1 and verse 35, um, two of John's disciples encounter Jesus and Jesus calls them to be disciples of him. So there is that kind of passing of the baton from John the Baptist to Jesus in that particular context. So first and foremost, discipleship is about learning and being a student of a master or teacher. But what Jesus does with that concept is something special and unique on two levels, really. The first one is that whereas a student at Morelands, for example, will take a degree and it will last usually three years, or if it's an MA, maybe four years part time. Um, and then they come to the end of that particular program and they graduate and they go on to do other things that use that learning. Jesus is saying that really there is no end point to the program of learning with him. It's not only lifelong unto the grave, but it's eternal because he himself shows us life beyond the grave, of course, because on the third day after being crucified, he was raised and he shows the way to eternity in his resurrection. So for him, our relationship is never one that means that we cease to be students of his teaching. We are forever his students. In fact, uh, he says to his own disciples in Matthew 23, verse 8, but you are not to be called teacher. The word for that that was used in Hebrew culture was rabbi. You're not to be called rabbi yourself, for you have one rabbi or one teacher, and you are all brothers. And the one teacher, of course, is Jesus. So it's a lifelong apprenticeship. It's a lifelong studentship. It's a lifelong discipleship that we're in. The other dimension of this particular use of the concept of discipleship by Jesus that we need to bear in mind is that it's for everybody. It's not for just a few people that sign up, for example, to be apprenticed to a rabbi. There were, there were a number of men, and it was men in those days, who would be attached to a, a wiser an older rabbi to learn the Torah, the law of God, the scriptures, um, the law and the prophets and the writings that we now call the Old Testament um, and their training would come to an end at some point and they themselves would go on to a position of responsibility quite often they would become rabbis themselves but Jesus is kind of pushing back against that in the case of his own disciples uh, in that text that I mentioned from uh, Matthew 23 8 because he's saying that not only is it lifelong but also that everybody, not just an elite few, but everybody who is called to follow him is to be his disciple. He calls uh, those who are to put their trust in him and to put their faith in him uh, very frequently uh, to follow him. And that concept of following Jesus and being his disciple are, you know, the two concepts are very closely linked. In Matthew 16, 24, through verse 26, he says, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. And that concept that uh, being a student of Jesus is not just about book learning. It's about actually following in his footsteps, living the life that he calls us to live, which is a sacrificial life, a tough life, a challenging life. That's at the core of what it means to be discipled by him and to be a disciple of him. And that calling is not just, as I say, for a special few. It's to everyone. 
who wants to be known as a Christian. And the ultimate expression of that, of course, is in the Great Commission at the end of Matthew's Gospel in Matthew 28, verse 19, where he says to his existing disciples, make disciples of all nations. We know, don't we, that the common popular version of discipleship is attached to his calling initially of 12 disciples. If you ask somebody at the bus stop who doesn't know Jesus very well or across the garden fence, somebody who's not a Christian, perhaps a neighbor of yours, uh, what do you understand by discipleship? They'll say, oh, Jesus had 12 of them, didn't he? And he certainly did. And that's very clear in Matthew 10, 1. But also um, he calls subsequently in Luke chapter 10, 72, a wider circle of disciples to support him and follow him. And then ultimately, as we see in Matthew 28, he calls all of those who he's made disciples to make disciples of others. Before I came to Dorset and Moorlands, uh, I was in the Diocese of Southern and Nottingham, and that had a slogan which was um, disciples making disciples. Uh, the idea that we replicate our studentship, our apprenticeship to Christ, and we commend it to, to others. Everybody who is called to be a Christian, everybody who is wanting to follow Christ is a disciple by definition. And that's really important to say. And that's one of the distinctives over against the model of discipleship that pertained in Jesus' day. It was lifelong. You never stop being a learner with Jesus as your rabbi. And it's also for everybody, everybody who wants to trust in Christ. Malcolm Gladwell, the author, the cultural commentator, has talked about how people like Bill Gates, the great sort of Microsoft entrepreneur, the Beatles, um, and a lot of elite sports people have to put in at least 10,000 hours in his book, Outliers, you might know it, you have to put in at least 10,000 hours of preparation and practice to be good at what they do, to be outstanding at what they do. Well, from Jesus's perspective, even that's not enough because he's gonna carry us through in our discipleship to the end of our life and into all eternity with him as we never stop being educated by the Lord and master, our ultimate teacher. Paul knew this. Paul understood that when his life was turned around by Jesus, that was going to be for the whole of the rest of his existence into eternity. Um, and he knew that there was a cost involved. And that's another aspect of discipleship with Jesus that needs to be stressed. And it's kind of modeled by the author of Philippians, the letter we're looking at here, because Paul, as you know, uh, in Acts chapter nine is an elite rabbi himself. He sat at the feet of a really great rabbi called Gamaliel, and he's been charged with persecuting Christians to keep the, the Jewish faith pure and not be sullied by this heresy of the teaching of Jesus as it would have been seen by the Pharisees, uh, just as he was a Pharisee. And um, Jesus encounters him, the risen Jesus on the road to Damascus, his life is wrecked in one sense, but it's redeemed. And although he's lost his status and he's lost his dignity to some degree, um, his life from then on will be a life dedicated as a pupil to the master, Jesus, as a disciple to the teacher uh, who is the Lord of life. And Paul knows that it's going to cost him. He knows that um, this isn't going to be straightforward. And when we get to Philippians 1, our text for tonight, we find Paul in verse 7 describing himself as in chains because he's been thrown in jail for witnessing to Jesus as the great teacher, as the Lord of life. And that bondage actually informs one of the key metaphors that he goes on to use to express what discipleship means. We'll see that in a moment, but I just want to make a point about Paul and discipleship. You see, the Greek word for disciple that Jesus uses and is used by the gospel writers is mathetes, which, as I've said, means fundamentally a student or a pupil who is learning to uh, develop their understanding of something and is trained to do something. But here's the thing. Paul never uses that particular word in his letters. The word mathetes never appears in Paul's letters curiously enough. 
but boy does he model it boy does he express the principle of discipleship in other ways and one of the key ways he does that at the very very beginning of this letter is to draw on his experience of being in bondage and of his knowledge of the old testament to say that being a disciple of christ is to be a slave of christ to be a slave of christ in fact he describes he and timothy who are the ones who sort of give shape to this letter in their own ministry who've accompanied each other uh, around the mediterranean uh, planting churches and proclaiming the gospel he says paul and timothy servants or slaves more particularly uh, of christ jesus now this word douloi which means uh, slaves which was often translated slaves uh, is a word that paul would have been very familiar with from the greek version of the old testament that he would have studied and from the Old Testament uh, Hebrew itself. Um, slavery was a big part of the world of the law and the prophets of the Old Testament scriptures. Uh, slaves were those who were captured in war in Numbers 31, um, who were uh, plunder from war um, in that battle with the Midianites that the Israelites fought. Uh, they were regarded as potential slaves those who are captured in texts like that they could be sold and bought as property which is when you think about it iniquitous uh, for people made in the image of god but we see that in leviticus 24 as a fact of uh, the ancient world they were sometimes people who entered into slavery voluntarily because they were living in danger of their life and that was at least one way to protect themselves from that even worse fate um, they could work in the royal court. We see that in uh, Saul's case in 2 Samuel 9, 2. Uh, they could be apprenticed to priests and assist them in the work of the tabernacle and then later the temple. Um, we see that in, two, uh, in 1 Samuel 2, 15, for example. And then in the New Testament itself, in 1 Peter 2, 18 to 25, they were often brought by a master into a household of extended family and would live with the family and uh, would serve the family under that roof and uh, be given board and so on uh, as a result. And actually in that knowledge that Paul had of what slavery meant was a spectrum of different forms of slavery, some utterly brutal and appalling, some more akin actually to servanthood, um, not well off, not the life that you know might be dreamt of but nonetheless one in which you at least were fed and sheltered and um, that's why actually uh, the word used here at the beginning of Philippians is sometimes translated servants because what we perceive to be a, a hard line between slavery is forced labor with no pay uh, bondage bonded labor if you like and and service as paid not very much but you know with the uh, benefit in kind if you like of, of food and lodging um, that divide didn't really apply so so rigidly in the ancient world there were different forms of slavery the main thing though is that for Paul no form of slavery is great and um, although he does uh, on occasion tell slaves for example in Ephesians 6 5 and Colossians 3.22, to obey their masters, uh, it's more a recognition of keeping the peace in an economy where slavery was just a reality that he wasn't going to overturn with a small group of Christians overnight, um, and uh, he was just asking slaves to model dignity uh, in the face of that kind of oppressive uh, structure in society. But what Paul is clear about is that trading slaves in 1 Timothy 10, 1 Timothy 1.10 is deeply evil, deeply, deeply evil. And he cast it as completely opposed to the kingdom of God. And it's that in particular that inspired the great abolitionists of the 18th and 19th centuries, William Wilberforce, Thomas Clarkson, Oluda Equiano, to oppose the sale of slaves, the trading of slaves in the British Empire. And of course, now we regard those as heroes. 
And Paul himself, as I stress, sees slavery as not a great thing in the natural run of life, not something to aspire to, something to be put up with, but not to be aspired to, except in the spiritual sense. And he uses slavery as a metaphor for our being bound to Christ as our teacher. And the idea is not a literal form of slavery in which Christ oppresses us as a master often oppressed his slaves. It's one in which Christ liberates us. Christ is the most benign master that we could ever imagine because our being bonded to him in love and fellowship and service is something that redounds to our glory. We gain eternal life because the one who liberates us from the greatest slavery, death and sin, is Jesus himself, our teacher. It's worth being his student. It's worth being even his slave, because ultimately, by being a, obedient to him, we are freed for all eternity. There is a cost to discipleship, and that's what Paul is trying to convey here with the metaphor of slavery. There's a cost, a big cost to, to, to discipleship, but the end reward is infinite and infinitely blessed. Dietrich Bonhoeffer wrote a book called Cost of Discipleship about the, the price that has to be paid in following Jesus. He was a Lutheran pastor who opposed the Nazis in the 1930s, theologian who wrote very eloquently about that experience. And in his book, Cost of Discipleship in 1937, he reflected on the importance of this metaphor of, of being a slave for Christ and what one has to give up. He said actually at one point, when Christ calls a man, he bids him to come and die. Thinking back to that call of Christ to take up our cross and follow him. And for some, that is the price that they had to pay. Paul died, as we understand it, in Rome as a martyr. Bonhoeffer himself, for opposing Hitler, was hanged in Flossenburg jail in April 1945 at the end of the war. Dallas Willard writes in his book, The Spirit of the Disciplines, about discipleship. He says to depart from righteousness is to choose a life of crushing burdens, failures and disappointments, a life caught in the toils of endless problems that are never resolved. The cost of discipleship, he's echoing Bonhoeffer there, the cost of discipleship, though it may take all we have is small when compared to the lot of those who don't accept Christ's invitation to be a part of his company in the way of life. We're living through a tough time right now, aren't we? COVID-19 has taken the lives of many Christians as well as others, and it certainly meant misery for many more who've survived it but have felt the after effects. It's also been oppressive, even enslaving in one sense, for people who felt the burden of lockdown and the loneliness of that and the crushing disappointment of not being able to spend time with family and friends, to hug a neighbour, to hug a loved one. And as a result of this, I think this metaphor of slaves to Christ is particularly relevant for where we are right now. And it's important to say to those who don't know Jesus that this discipleship that Jesus calls us to may be particularly tough. It may require sacrifices for the good of our neighbour and ourselves and for God ultimately. But the reward of keeping close to Jesus and obeying his word is immense, is eternal, is eternal joy. I've said already that that word douloi, that word that would often be translated slaves of Christ, can be rendered servants of Christ. But also, uh, Paul goes on in the same verse to talk about uh, overseers and deacons in the church there in Philippi. And Deacons there is an echo of a ministry that emerges in the early days of the church in Acts chapter six, where the apostles, the disciples of Jesus, the, the 12, if you like, and the close circle of those charged with preaching and teaching, um, they are so busy that they hand on responsibility for 
distribution of food, for doing all those good acts of service that are loving the neighbor in the wider community to seven deacons, they're called deacons, which means servants. It's another word that means servants. We translate it sometimes ministers, but it's not about ordination, not at this stage at least. It's about collective church service of others in the church and of those who are disadvantaged in the wider community in particular. Now later, the church developed a threefold order of ministry that the Church of England still accords with, where you have bishops who are like the overseers here, who look after a number of churches, uh, priests or presbyters who are ministers of word and sacraments, and deacons who assist the ministers in those acts of service. But at this point, the really important thing to stress is we're talking about a collective ministry of the whole people of God, in which some may specialise, called deacons, um, but in which everybody is called to love their neighbour with acts of gracious service. One of the things that's heartened me in this COVID-19 crisis is the ministry of Christians around food banks. 63% or thereabouts of food banks in the UK are run by Christian charities or church networks. The Trussell Trust is a Christian foundation, uh, Beesom and other networks are doing phenomenal work at a time when many people need that support in this time of coronavirus. And we should be pleased and grateful for the fact that the church is making its mark in that way, because it's an expression of that corporate discipleship, that servanthood that uh, I've been speaking about. Likewise, the ministry at the moment of Christians Against Poverty in debt counselling, uh, when people are getting into financial difficulties because of COVID, uh, around job centres trying to find jobs for those who've lost their jobs in this pandemic, and around addiction for those whose loneliness and whose lockdown has caused them to fall into those particular problems. And um, that is something that we can also celebrate as Christians as an act of discipleship, a corporate discipleship. Now, I've talked about the collective nature of discipleship in relation to slavery to Christ and servanthood to Christ. And that applies also to the final metaphor that I'm going to talk about here, which is also in verse one. And it's the metaphor of sainthood or the holy ones of God. It's not really a metaphor. It's a description of a reality because holiness in the Old Testament and the new is about moral purity and about being set apart from sin. So the ultimate holy one, of course, is God, because he is without sin completely, as Jesus was. But he calls us through Christ and his example and his teaching of us to holiness ourselves, to being as pure as possible, to being as free from sin as we can be. Now, in its history, the church has called saints those individuals who particularly model holiness, people like St. Paul himself, as we now call him, uh, who gave his name to St. Paul's Throop, of course, and St. Francis of Assisi or St. Teresa of Avila, or more recently in the Catholic tradition, which really does formalize this process of sainthood, John Paul II, the Pope who uh, died a number of years ago. But really biblically, the important thing to stress is that whenever you see this word holy ones or saints, um, really it's always in the plural when it's referring to people. It's always in the plural. We don't have individual saints singled out in that way. Um, so it, it's fine to recognize heroes and heroines of the faith. Uh, the Protestant tradition may not have a formal system of saints, but there are figures like um, Martin Luther, figures like John Wesley, figures like um, Billy Graham, who are recognized as real great examples that we all revere. Um, nonetheless, what Paul's talking about here is the whole church, the whole people of God who are called to be set apart for the good news, the proclamation of the good news, making disciples, even as they are disciples themselves. And they do that as he goes on to say in verse four, through prayer, he's been praying for the Philippians continually 
and he expects the same of them through partnership in the gospel that collective sense of purpose that he describes in verse five here through perseverance he's talking about discipleship being right through to the day of the lord when history is wrapped up and we are taken into eternity around god's throne so we we persevere through the grace of god together we support each other and then finally it ends in praise and adoration in verse 11 it ends in what he describes there as the glory and praise of god all of this is made possible by jesus himself who paul goes on in chapter two to describe as the one who himself was humbled even unto death death on a cross it all centers in him this collective slavery this collective servanthood this collective sainthood which frees us for eternal life is made possible by jesus our savior whether it's in a time of covid19 or any time these truths are precious and deep they mean a massive amount to me as a teacher and educator in the gospel but they are precious truths for all of us may god bless you and may we live our life of discipleship together to his glory amen Let's just um, take a moment to pray uh, in response to what we've heard. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you call us into a life of discipleship. Call us to be followers of your son, our saviour, Jesus Christ. And we pray, Father, we'd note those descriptions of disciples from Paul's letter to the Philippians. Lord, we'd note that we are slaves of a benign and living, loving God, that we are servants and that we are saints, we are holy ones. These are all things we're called to be. And we pray, Heavenly Father, that you would empower us by your Holy Spirit to live what we've become, to live what Paul describes, to live lives worthy of the gospel. We commit ourselves to you for this purpose, in Jesus' name. Amen. The example we follow is the example of Jesus. Uh, Jesus, the ultimate servant. Jesus, the servant king. That's the name of our next song. Just now 
servant king is at the heart of our faith and it's our faith in him that we declare now together and uh, we're using one of the shorter creeds to do that today you should be able to see the words on your screen and we say together we believe in god the father from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named we believe in God the Son, who lives in our hearts through faith and fills us with his love. We believe in God the Holy Spirit, who strengthens us with power from on high. We believe in one God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Amen. And so we come to a time of prayer. Let's pray for our world, for our church, and for ourselves. As we come before the God who hears, the God who listens, and the God who acts. And loving Heavenly Father, we pray again for the strength to be your disciples. For the strength to be slaves, bonded to you to a life of freedom, a life of eternity that begins now and goes on forever. And Lord, may that life of slavery, of servanthood, servanthood and, and of holiness, Lord, may it direct others towards you and may it bring you glory. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. And Father, we pray for this world that is your world. That we share with you and we pray for the world still under the grip of this virus of covid19 lord we pray for the grieving those who have lost loved ones because of this virus 
And Lord, we pray you would bring them peace. We pray for the unwell, those still in intensive care units, those in hospital, those on all kinds of breathing apparatus, those in that place of ill health and struggle. Lord, we pray that you would bring them healing. Lord, we pray for the physicians, for those professionals taking care of all those people, the nurses, the doctors, the ambulance drivers, all those involved in the caring uh, around hospitals and the well-being of those who are ill. Lord, at this point in time, when they are so overwhelmed, we pray that you would give them strength, supernatural strength that will help them to stand in the midst of their trials. Lord, we pray for these vaccines. And Lord, we pray that they would take effect. And in doing so, just restore our nation and the nations of the world to a place of health and confidence and a place of being able to be with one another again. And Lord, I pray for the rest of us waiting, waiting to be able to be with those we love, waiting to be in the mix with people, waiting to gather again with others. Lord, give us patience and give us a sense of what is right at this time, how best we can love our neighbours. Lord, we pray in the midst of this virus for your presence in the world. In your name we pray. Amen. Lord, we pray, we pray too for an end to inequality as a result of this virus. We pray that the vaccine would be available to all nations of the world, from the poorest to the richest, and that money wouldn't just buy preference and preferential treatment. We pray for an end to inequality to access to medicine. We pray too for an end to food inequality. The food banks have never been so busy. The economic impact is huge. And Lord, we pray that people across our nation and across the world will be able to feed their families despite this virus. And Lord, we pray also for those we know. We pray for our church family, for our own families and for our friends. We pray for those who have needs other than that of the virus. We pray for those who are struggling with treatments, recovering from illness, And the whole process is slowed down because of the impact of the virus. But their care is still there and needed and is important. And we think tonight especially of Rosemary. And we think tonight especially of Martin. In all that they face. And in a quiet moment we think of others known to us personally. Who have similar needs. And Father, we pray for those that we're not seeing, for the loved ones that we haven't seen for a while. We pray too for those who live on their own and the loneliness that is there anyway, but accentuated by this lockdown. Lord, meet them where they are and assure them of your presence with them. Lord, for all of these prayers, we lay them, Lord, at your feet, and pray that you would hear our prayer, for we ask it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.
And so this is the point where we're going to come to remember all that Jesus has done for us, where we take bread and we take wine and we celebrate that he has, as servant of us, laid down his life for us and that he has made it possible to be reunited with our Heavenly Father. Being in that place of knowing that Jesus has made us right with our Father is a source of great peace. So the peace of the Lord be always with you. And I can hear you saying back, and also with you. Share the peace, perhaps, with the people that you are with. Or if you're on your own, take a moment and just think about someone else in our church family or in your own family. And imagine saying the peace to them and sharing it with them. And now we come to share bread and wine together. So if you've got some with you, have it ready in front of you. And um, we will uh, continue, but we'll focus on the bread and the wine, which should be on the screen now. And we'll have the words to The Lord is here. His spirit is with us. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks and praise. It is always right to give you thanks, God our Creator, loving and faithful, holy and strong. You made us and the whole universe and filled your world with life. You sent your Son to live among us, Jesus our Saviour, Mary's child. He suffered on the cross. He died to save us from our sins. He rose in glory from the dead. You send your spirit to bring new life to the world and clothe us, with, clothe us with power from on high. And so we join the angels to celebrate and sing, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Father, on the night before he died, Jesus shared a meal with his friends. He took the bread and thanked you. He broke it and gave it to them, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this to remember me. After the meal, Jesus took the cup of wine. He thanked you and gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood, the new promise of God's unfailing love. Do this to remember me. Great is the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Father, as we bring this bread and wine and remember his death and resurrection, send your Holy Spirit that we who share these gifts may be fed by Christ's body and blood. Pour your Spirit on us that we may love one another, work for the healing of the earth, and share the good news of Jesus as we wait for his coming in glory. For honour and praise belong to you, Father, with Jesus, your Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, for ever and ever. Amen. And as Jesus taught us, so we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. And so we break this bread to share in the body of Christ. Though we are many, we are one body because we all share in one bread. Draw near with faith. Receive the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he gave for you, and his blood which he shed for you. Eat and drink in remembrance that he died for you, and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. And so at this point, if you have bread and wine with you, now is the time to share it 
if you're with someone else or to take it if you're on your own. Say simple words to one another, the body of Christ, the blood of Christ. And so having received from him, we say thank you. We pray together. Almighty God, we thank you for feeding us with the body and blood of your son, Jesus Christ. Through him, we offer you our souls and bodies to be a living sacrifice. Send us out in the power of your spirit to live and work to your praise and glory. Amen. And at the heart of us being servants to Jesus is his modelling of servitude to us. And where do we see that most? David mentioned it in his sermon. We see it most when we, looked to the, when we look to the cross and remember where he went for you and for me as an act of service to us individually, but also to the whole of humanity. So our final song is When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. When I survey
So as we come to the end of our service this evening, uh, closing prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, you humbled yourself in taking the form of a servant and in obedience died on the cross for our salvation. Give us the courage to follow you and to proclaim you as Lord and King to the glory of God the Father. Amen. And the blessing of God, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen. Thanks for being here this evening. Thanks for uh, putting up with the bumps in the road as I try to drive and read a map at the same time, um, which is the equivalent of what I've just done, which was a stupid thing to do. But uh, apologies for the bumps in the road. I hope you've hung in there with us, and I hope the Lord has blessed you in spite of those bumps in the road. Um, but great to share with you, and I look forward to sharing with you again soon. God bless. Take care. Have a great week. <laughs>